Nikki Wright has served as the executive director of Sea Change Marine Conservation Society since 1998. Sea Change is a nonprofit charitable society working with community partners on marine education, conservation, and restoration in the Salish Sea and BC. In the year 2000, 1,800 eelgrass shoots were transplanted in Todd Inlet, also known as Sneakwith and Sanchothin, a small inlet of Saanich Inlet north of BC. Victoria, BC, excuse me. From that success was born the Seagrass Conservation Working Group in 2001 and over 400 restored eelgrass habitats within the Salish Sea. Oh, it's always interesting to get on these, <laughs> on these digital sites. Um, <clears throat> I have to recover from seeing 100 images of myself. So I'm just so pleased to be a part of this and I'm just um, so grateful for those two excellent um, presentations and much of what I'm going to say is kind of a review. So um, I don't think this will take very long and then that'll be allow us to talk more about um, answering questions and inquiries. So I first want to just begin with giving my um, gratitude and honor Trish Farrell, who was one of the founding members of Sea Change way back in 98. And she is seen here speaking to high school youth on Thetis Island when we are part of a program for uh, high school students across Canada who would board uh, motor vessels and sailboats during their spring break and come into the Gulf Islands. This happened for about five years. <clears throat> and as each year went on, we were able to talk more about the near shore ecology and conservation issues, but other issues were First Nations fisheries and sustainable forestry and a whole myriad uh, slew of subjects, which the students would be totally involved with for a week. Um, Trish here is explaining how she remembers as a youth in Deep Bay, the herring coming into the near shore and her community collecting them on cedar boughs and storing them in bins. And she had a great story that really uh, enchanted the students about taking the row or the herring eggs off the bow, off the boughs um, in the back of uh, grandma. And of course, grandma had eyes on the back of her head. So without turning her head, grandma would inquiry, inquire, how good are those eggs? And of course her mouth was full, but Trish said they were excellent. That speech that she gave to the high school students so many years ago um, influenced my thinking about how could we give back to the oceans. I was really sick and tired even back in those days of attending fish conferences where we were talking about sustainable yields, which I think is uh, an impossible task and an impossible concept. Um, and so as an organization, I was trying to figure out how could we give back to the oceans instead of keep taking until there's nothing left. And because of her speech, it, it occurred to me that um, we could look at the near shore vegetation that's affected by development and all kinds of human impacts and see where it could be restored. So that started our journey into eelgrass restoration. So even though my topic is supposedly about kelp, <clears throat> I'm really going to center in about eelgrass. Uh, did such a good job of, of speaking about. So back in, <clears throat> excuse me, back in 2012 to 2014, we had the privilege of mapping eelgrass habitat in all 13 islands within the Islands Trust area. And in so doing, we were able to also identify those places that could be possibly restored. If we could figure out the reasons why they were damaged or completely gone. And so that sort of started us on a journey for a more widespread restoration scope within the Southern Sailor Sea. So this was one of the maps that we created with the Galliano Conservancy. It's the um, eelgrass that um, was found during that 2012, the three year period on Main Island, the red uh, is showing the continuous flatbeds and the yellowish is the more the fringing continuous. And you can see that those areas are in really vulnerable uh, estuaries and quiet bays. And they're vulnerable because those are the sites 
that will be very affected by rising sea levels. So there's a whole area of critical salmon and other marine wildlife habitat that is at high risk right now. So because of that mapping, we, we continued on our trajectory on a wider scale um, in House Sound, Gulf Islands, Sorelli Tooth Territory of Burrard Inlet and Seashelt Inlet. And approximately 40 sites have been restored and we have an approximate 70% success rate based on shoot density and area extent. And we monitor our sites every six months for five years. So this is just a map to show the sites that we've been working in um, and quite intensively around Pender and Saturna um, Islands and some of Thetis and a little bit of Gabriola Island. So from Gabriola uh, all the way down to Saturna. So what's so bloody important about near shores? Well, I think the last two excellent presentations have really driven it home that it's a wealth of ecological assets not only for marine wildlife, but for us as well. So if we take care of all of that, it will take care of us. And uh, we've also talked about what a living system it is. So if we're talking about the back shore, we've, we've talked about how that filters contaminants and provides wildlife as well as <laughs> our own homes. And um, uh, food for salmon as well as shading for forage fish. And when we talk about forage fish, we're talking about the sand lance and surf smelt that actually spawn on beaches from down here in the Salish Sea around November until spring. And then as we go uh, closer, so we have the sand lance and surf smelt habitat here. And as we go in, we have the fucus and the eelgrass and the food for the larvae and on and on and on. And it goes all the way out into the kelp forest. And then the deeper water is called the pelagic zone where we have less light availability for vegetative habitat. But when we talk about eelgrass or we talk about kelp or we talk about wetlands, it's just so important to think of it as one whole system and um, how they're so interconnected. I love what Jennifer referred to as habitat connectivity. So as we think about freshwater systems coming into the saltwater system, all of that integrity of each piece of the watershed all the way down to the estuary or the bays is primary for not only all the marine wildlife upon which it depends, but for all of us as well. Uh, we talked quite a bit about salmon highways. Um, we. Canadians stole that phrase from the Puget Sound folks. <laughs> I love it because um, the reasons being that they're, they function as nurseries um, to provide food for approximately 80% of commercially important fish stocks, and they serve as a refugia from predators and waves. It's just a few reasons why these estuaries are so important. And of course, for the herring that are really highly uh, much at risk in the Salish Sea, if um, they rely so much on vegetation for spawning, then it just makes sense that we pay attention to the conservation and restoration of these habitats. And that's what an egg looks like as it's developing. That's pretty cool. When you see it under a microscope, it's very cool. So that's on a grain of sand, and that's sand lance larvae, which then goes, um, develops into juveniles and uses the near shore extensively for shelter and food. So those sandy beaches have so much import for the bottom of the food web upon which orcas depend upon, not to mention the salmon in between. So I was gonna just talk a little bit about the overwater structures, but more in particular, about docks um, because that's, um, we kind of went from the large scale of an area as large as Puget Sound 
to a smaller but large estuary in uh, the northern part of the Salish Sea. Now we're going to be talking more about the Gulf Islands and how docks could be affecting habitats and eventually our way of life, our livelihood, if we allow them to become um, overdeveloped and overabundant in this beautiful, beautiful area of the Salish Sea. So here's a pretty radical picture. This is not of the Gulf Islands, but it shows you multiple docks along here. And I just wanted to show that that could interfere very much with the concept of a salmon highway. It's sort of like, since we're talking about the Gulf Islands now, if we're trying to get from <clears throat> Schwartz Bay to Victoria and there is a landslide every kilometer, <laughs> that's what it would be like for a salmon to try to migrate or, to, or um, any kind of fish species all the way down to pipefish that would try to be using this area, um, trying to get from A to Z, um, as if we were going from Schwartz Bay to Victoria and had an obstacle in our, in our way. It would take a long time and be very uh, inefficient energy-wise. So from kelks to eelgrass, we have several processes and, and factors to think about when we're talking about uh, docks. And we're talking about um, controlling factors. So in the shallow near shore, we're talking about light availability. Wave energy has to be um, pretty slowed down. Water quality has to be quite good. And substrate has to be a sandy, muddy bottom. Um, when we talk about what does that provide? It provides habitat. If those factors are there and in good condition, then we have flora and fauna in those shallow waters. I'm sorry, my dog is acting out. I hope you can hear me. Then we have the processes that those habitats provide, which is temperature regulation, photosynthesis, uh, wave energy attenuation. If we have a lot of um, eelgrass meadows that are intact and continuous, it does slow the wave action coming to the shore. And um, water quality issues are mitigated because the rhizomes or the underwater stems of the eelgrass meadows, and this also applies to kelp, though it's an annual, slows down wave action, and therefore the sediment suspended in the water settles onto the seabed. So water quality is then improved. And then if you have all those conditions, because these habitats are flourishing. Then we have both the flora and fauna benefiting because of the refugia it provides and the food, um, as well as spawning sites for, for eggs and larvae. But we have the human benefits, and just a few of them are that both these habitats are carbon sinks. We call that blue carbon. Now, the, the good news is that the ocean is one huge area of carbon sequestration and storage. The bad news, which I just read in the paper yesterday, is that the ocean is becoming so saturated with carbon from the atmosphere that there's a possibility that the ocean could become an emitter, which just uh, really woke me up, that we're getting to that crisis point where we're saturating the ocean 75, 77% of the globe is so saturated with carbon from human impacts that it might become a carbon emitter. If that doesn't surprise you, um, I'd, be, I'd be kind of surprised. Um, other things, of course, is recreational values that when our near shores are in good shape, we have many, many uh, ways of recreating and economic uh, benefits, of course, from the salmon, the, um, the clams, the shellfish. So this is just a diagram taken from an article um, uh, written by the Washington State Transportation Commission that just shows the, the cascading effects of, if we have all those controlling factors, then we have the ecological fa functions for uh, flora and fauna, as well as <clears throat> the human assets. 
And as um, Jennifer had pointed out, we are facing climate change, as you can tell from the storms we've just experienced. So the declines in pH and O2 of the basin waters, which refers to the, the Salish Sea, partly imported from outside the Salish Sea and partly supported by the carbon cycling within the Strait of Georgia, could reduce the benthic and pelagic and habitat, pelagic meeting the deeper waters beyond kelp and sea level rise and storms. And you do recognize that photograph that Jennifer had, such as low-lying estuaries, intertidal zones, and mudflats are at risk. And that was written in 2009. So now we're experiencing what was forecasted. What does this have to do with overwater structures? Well, I just wanted to bring this in first. I don't like to do doomsday slideshows. I don't think it does any of us any credit. So I wanted to show you a nearshore site that we looked at uh, when we were doing a survey of the Saanich Peninsula and Inlet. And this is a pretty healthy system that we're looking at. When I was speaking to a Sartlip steward yesterday, he was reminding us of um, words that his elders have told him over and over again to leave it better than you found it. Because sometimes the, the cultural history and use of an area is corroded or lost because of all the things that have happened to First Nations over these years. But if we just stick to this adage of leave it better than you found it, then when we talk about overwater structures, we can look at what, what would be a healthy shoreline and how can we maintain it that way? And what would be the solutions if the need is to bring a boat to shore or to do recreation? So here's some um, good examples of in House Sound where we work, oftentimes people build um, docks that can be lifted up over the winter months. It makes sense because of the oncoming storms that are getting more severe. And I put this picture down here of the Lady Smith Adventure Center. And I didn't put it there for you to visit, though it's really interesting. But if you ever go to Lady Smith, go down to the, to the water there and look at their dock because it's, a, it's one of those structures that was referred to as light penetrating structure. And, and they did a very, very good job of their very long dock. So um, it's just a really good way of, of seeing something nearby that you could look at if you're considering building a dock. And my recommendation is to get together with your neighbors if there really is a, a crucial need for a dock and to see what dock is existing now in that bay where you live or close to it and see if it could be shared or to build a community dock. These are the kinds of resources, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a very blurry picture, but you've got resources that are really easy to get to. They're very accessible and they're downloadable, even if they're dated a bit. They're found on the Stewardship Center for BC website. And there's three of them, the shoreline structures for environmental design, the access near aquatic uh, areas and the coastal shore stewardship, which has been updated since then, but the news is all still up to date. Um, and as Stu pointed out, many of the informational points that he spoke about um, are, is included in these books, they're downloadable, as I said, they're free, and they can advise you as to questioning whether you really do need a dock. And if you do, how can you build one that's environmentally friendly so that light penetrates through it, so that the sediment does not shift from a vegetative one to maybe a shell hash one, because you're putting pilings in the water that encourage um, crustaceans, which then eventually die off and settle on the shells, settle on the substrate. So you're changing the substrate, you're changing the water quality, you're changing the wave action, and you're changing the light regime. And all those conditions cascade down to less habitats for flora and fauna, and then less functional uses for both the wildlife and for humans. It may not sound like a lot when you're talking about building one dock, in such a large area, but Salish Sea is now totally impacted by cumulative effects. 
all because there's so many people who love this area. We're loving it to death. I want to thank you all, and especially Cynthia Durantz, who started us on the journey of ecological restoration of eelgrass, the Islands Trust Conservancy, for, um, for all that they offer us as a community and everybody else. And this, I'm going to just keep on for a minute. And these are the resources that you might want to look at in more detail. If you live on a Gulf Island, the eelgrass map that was mapped in 2012 to 2014 of your area could be found on the Islands Trust um, Conservancy website under mapping. Uh, just a, sh a little note that the we were able to just have the resources to survey the presence or absence of eelgrass in the 13 islands within the Islands Trust area. And now it's being mapped uh, in greater detail, which will be very, very helpful for better planning decisions on the near shore. Stewardship Center for BC has excellent information, downloadable and free. And then the Seagrass Conservation Working Group and Sea Change is always there for you as well. And I really thank you for your attention. <laughs>